It was the last quarter of the 19th century and an uncommonly warm, bright June when a skinny, red-haired orphan girl arrived on Prince Edward Island off the coast of Canada. The little girl's name was Anne Shirley and she was very excited because she thought she'd found a home with Marilla Cuthbert and her brother Matthew. But the Cuthberts didn't want to adopt a little girl. They wanted a young boy who could help Matthew with all the work on their farm. Marilla, little Jerry Brute from the creek was here early this morning. If you don't mind, I told him I was thinking of hiring him for the summer. He'll be of great help. Don't try to sweet talk me into adopting this girl, Matthew Cuthbert. It was your idea to adopt a boy. <laughs> Goodbye, Bunny! Goodbye, Snow Queen! Goodbye, Mr. Cuthbert! Forget you, Mr. Cuthbert! Goodbye! <laughs> Goodbye, Green Gables! I've made up my mind to enjoy this drive. You have? It's been my experience that you can nearly always enjoy things if you make up your mind that you will. I'm not going to think about going back to the orphanage while we're having our drive. I'm just going to think about the drive and enjoy everything we might see. Oh, oh just look at the wild roses. Aren't they lovely? Don't you think they must be glad to be flowers, Miss Cuthbert? Wouldn't it be nice if roses could talk? I think it's a shame roses can't talk. I really do. I'm sure they'd be able to tell us lots of lovely things. And don't you think pink is the most bewitching colour in the whole world, Miss Cuthbert? I really do love the colour pink, but I can't possibly wear it. I have red hair and red-headed people can't wear pink, not even in their imagination. Miss Cuthbert, have you ever known of anybody whose hair was as red as mine when she was young, but fortunately for her got to be another colour when she grew up? No, I never have. Of course, redheads also become grey with age, but you still have to wait a few years until that happens. Well, that's yet another hope gone for me, I suppose. You know, Miss Cuthbert, I can tell you honestly that my life's been a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. That's a sentence I saw in a book I once read, and I say it over and over to comfort myself whenever I feel disappointed or very miserable. I don't see where the comforting comes in, my child, comparing your life to a graveyard. Don't you understand? Because it sounds so nice and sad and romantic at the same time. Just as if I were a heroine in a romantic book. I must confess I'm very fond of romantic things. Hmm? Are we going to cross the Lake of Shining Waters today? If by that you mean Barry's Pond, girl, unfortunately I have to disappoint you. We're not going that way. We're going by the shore road, which is a great deal shorter. <laughs> it sure road sounds so nice. I can hardly wait to see it. I love getting to know new places, Miss Cuthbert. Would you like me to tell you a secret, Miss Cuthbert? As you said the word shore road, I saw a picture in my mind. 
Well, now, fancy that. We still have to travel about five miles before we reach White Sands, girl. Why don't you tell me a little more about yourself while we're driving? Of course, but what I know about myself isn't really worth telling. If you'd only let me tell you what I imagined about myself, I'm quite sure you'd think it's ever so much more interesting. No, dear child, none of your imaginings. You just stick to the bold facts. Begin at the beginning and tell me everything you know. Where were you born and how old are you? And do you have any idea who your parents were? What's wrong, Anne? Come on, there's no need to be afraid. I'm not. I don't want to because it would serve no purpose. Huh? I don't want to tell you. I don't want to remember. Not now. Well, look who's here. How do you do, Marilla? I assume this is the little orphan you told me about. I'm quite surprised. Rachel told me you'd be adopting a little boy, not a little girl. And I'd be very surprised if the clever Rachel wasn't able to distinguish between a boy and a girl, I must say, Marilla. Oh, it's all a silly mistake, that's all. What Rachel said is true. We did want a boy. But because of some oversight, they sent us this girl instead. Mm, you poor things. You can be sure you have all my sympathy, Marilla. Fancy that this should have happened to you and Matthew. Well, I'll admit I'm also puzzled by this mistake. And that's why we're on our way to Mrs Spencer to ask her how on earth something like this could have happened. I see. I wish you everything of the best, Marilla, and I'm sure you'll be able to solve this vexing problem. It's a real shame about the little girl, though. We'll, we'll talk about this another time. Oh! Anne? What on earth are you doing? Anne, come back! Come back this minute! Anne! Mm. We forgot entirely that the poor little child was listening to every single word we said. Of course she feels hurt by it. I'm the one that's sorry, Anne. I should have had more consideration for you. Thank you. If you're still interested in hearing it, Miss Cuthbert, I'll tell you the story of my life as I know it. Bolingbroke, Nova Scotia, and I turned 11 in March. My father's name was Walter Shirley, and he was a teacher at Bolingbroke High. My mother's name was Bertha Shirley. Don't you think Walter and Bertha are lovely names, Miss Cuthbert? It makes me extremely happy to know that both my parents are such nice-sounding names. I think if I had a father named, uh... Well, let's say Jedediah, it would have been a real disgrace, wouldn't you agree? Oh, I don't think a name is of such great importance. What really matters more is that one behaves oneself, child. Well, I don't know. 
I read in a book once that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but I've honestly never been able to believe it. It doesn't make sense to me, Miss Cuthbert. You see, I believe a rose is something special. Somehow I just don't believe a rose would be quite as nice if it were called a thistle or skunk cabbage or poisoned ivy. I suppose my father could still have been a very good man, even if he had been called Jedediah, but I'm sure it would have been agony. Mm. Well, at least now I know exactly what you think about names, my girl. Do you think you could tell me a bit more about yourself? My mother was a teacher at the high school too, but when she married my father, she gave up teaching and stayed at home. Shortly after they got married, they went to live in a teeny-weeny but ever so cosy little yellow house in a place called Bolingbrook. I've never seen that house, but I've imagined it. Oh, I've imagined it thousands of times, you know. I think it must have had honeysuckle over the parlour windows. And lilacs in the front yard. And lilies of the valley just inside the gate. There were roses at the front gate and birch trees in the garden. Yes, and curtains at all the windows. You know, I've thought about it so often that I can still see it so clearly without even having to shut my eyes. The picket fence was painted white. My parents took great care to have everything clean and proper, and they made sure that the paint never peeled off the fence. My mother decided the curtain should be muslin. I think any room looks so much better when there are clean curtains at the window. Don't you also think it's important, Miss Cuthbert? Well, whether the curtains were freshly laundered or not, that's the house in which I was born, the Shirley residence. I've been told that I was a scrawny and tiny little thing. <laughs> but my mother still believed I was the most perfect little baby in the whole world. Besides, I should think a mother would be a better judge than any other person of whether a baby was beautiful or not. Don't you agree? <laughs> Every mother thinks her own baby's the most beautiful baby ever to be born, child. Oh. Yes, you may be right, but still it makes me happy to know my mother was satisfied with me. It would really make me feel awfully sad if I thought I was a disappointment to her because she didn't live long after that, you know. Her mother suddenly died of a fever when I was only three months old, Miss Cuthbert. I don't think it's fair that she died so soon. She was far too young and she had a little baby to take care of. I do sometimes wish she lived long enough for me to be able to talk to her and to remember calling her mother. It makes me sad to think about it. I think it gives you a very special feeling of belonging to call someone mother, don't you? Whenever I read a book or overhear a conversation in which somebody or other uses the word mother, I always imagine that I'm the one using that beautiful word. My mother. Or darling mother. Or mummy. Dearest mummy. Oh well, in any event, that's how I imagine I would speak to my mother if I were fortunate enough to have a mother. Naturally, I couldn't say it then because I was just a little baby. It's totally impossible for a baby of only three months old to say mother even if she wanted to. Father died only four days after mother. That left me an orphan and folks were at their wits end what to do with me. I didn't have any living relatives. <coughs> You see, Miss Cuthbert, even when I was a little baby, nobody wanted me. It seems to be my fate. Maybe they guessed that I'd have red hair later on. <sighs> Anne was quiet, lost in thought. She didn't know what she should tell Marilla about her past life. Marilla sensed that Anne was uncomfortable and didn't want to press her about her past.
like my parents had died, as I've told you already. And since no one wanted me, they didn't know what to do with me. Mrs. Thomas was a poor woman who came in to clean, and she said she'd take me, even though she was poor and had a drunken husband. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas moved away from Bolingbrook to Marysville, and I lived with them until I was eight years old. I looked after their children. There were four of them, younger than me. She was a very kind lady, but he often shouted at us. And when the younger children cried because they were scared of him, I was punished. It was a trying time for me. I liked the little Thomas children, but I was still little myself. I gave them all the love that I had always longed for. And then Mr. Thomas was killed falling under a train. We were shocked when we heard what had happened. Although we hadn't liked him all that much, we had never wished him such an end. Mrs. Thomas went to live with Mr. Thomas's mother, but she didn't want me. Then Mrs. Hammond from up the river came along and said she'd take me, seeing I was good with children. I went up the river to live with her in a little clearing among the tree stumps. It was a very lonesome place. There were no flowers. I imagined the desert must look exactly like that. I'm sure I could never have lived there if I hadn't had an imagination. Everything was grey and dark. There were no colours anywhere. Mr. Hammond worked a little sawmill up there. And Mrs. Hammond had eight children. She had twins three times. I like babies in moderation, but twins three times in succession is too much. I told Mrs. Hammond so firmly when the last pair arrived. I used to get so dreadfully tired carrying them around. Eight children are simply too much for a girl of my age. If she continued carrying on as she had, the eight children might easily have become twelve or even fourteen. It was my duty to teach the Hammond children to walk. And then we suffered through that unbearably cold winter. Mr. Hammond died of pneumonia. And Mrs. Hammond broke up the household. She divided her children among her relatives and went to live in the United States. No one wanted me. Who wants an orphan with red hair anyway? I had to go to the orphanage in Hopetown because no one would take me. They didn't want me at the orphanage either. They said they were overcrowded as it was. But in the end they had to take me in. And I was to stay there for four months until the other day when Mrs. Spencer came, Miss Cuthbert. Did you ever go to school during those years? Yes, I did. Not a great deal, unfortunately. When I lived with Mrs. Hammond, we were so far from the school that I couldn't walk there in winter, and there was vacation in the summer. So I could only go in the spring and fall. Of course, I went there while I was the orphanage. I can read pretty well, and I know ever so many pieces of poetry up by heart. I just love poetry, and I have a very good memory. When my mother and father died, I was fortunate enough to inherit all their books, and when I was big enough, I read them all. The problem is, I read these books so often, I learnt them off by heart. But sadly, they all landed in the rubbish when Mrs. Hammond gave up her children in housekeeping and moved to the United States of America. Hmm. Tell me, um, tell me, girl, were those two women... I mean, Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Hammond, you were telling me about. Were they good to you? Oh. They really meant to be good to me, I'm sure, but they had a good deal to worry them, Miss Cup, but they simply didn't have time to worry about an orphan like me. It's very trying to live with a drunken husband, you see, and to have twins three times in succession, but I feel sure they meant to be good to me. Both of them had very good hearts, Miss Cuthbert. 
I have absolutely no doubt that they both meant to be just as good and kind as possible. I desperately tried to help, but at the same time I was merely an additional burden to them. I was an extra hungry mouth to feed, and it must have been very difficult for them, Miss Cuthbert. When you carefully consider all of this, I must admit that both of them were really very good to me. Marilla asked no more questions. She guided the horse while she pondered deeply. She couldn't help feeling sorry for the child. What an unloved life she'd led, a life of drudgery, poverty, and neglect. It was a pity she had to be sent back. What if she, Marilla, should indulge Matthew's unaccountable whim and let her stay? He had his heart set on it, and the child seemed to have potential. But what would be the sensible thing to do? Marilla had always regarded herself as utterly sensible. to you, Miss Cuthbert, you know. Once, when I lived in Marysville, Mr. Thomas took us all to spend the day at the seaside. <laughs> I enjoyed every moment of that day. Not even the fact that I had to look after all those children all day long to keep them from drowning spoiled it for me. I felt so sorry for those poor little children who never had the opportunity to learn to swim as I did. Girl, to wake up at sunrise and swoop down over the water and up and away out over that lovely blue sea all day long and then at night to fly straight back to your own nest. Could you please tell me what that big white house is that I see in the distance, Miss Cuthbert? Oh, I do hope with all my heart it isn't Mrs. Spencer's place. No, that's the White Sands Hotel. Many Americans stay there during the summer when they're on vacation here on Prince Edward Island. Oh, I was so afraid it might be Mrs. Spencer's place. I don't want us to get there so soon. Somehow, Miss Cuthbert, when we get there, it will seem like the end of everything. Although Anne wished that the journey would never end, she knew it was unrealistic. They would soon meet Mrs. Spencer, and a decision about her future would then be taken. But she hadn't quite given up hope that she might be allowed to stay at Green Gables forever. When Marilla explained that a mistake had been made and that they couldn't keep her, Mrs. Spencer was speechless. Then she said that it might not be necessary to send her back, because she had a neighbor who'd like to adopt a young girl. But more about that next time. Thank you. 